God bless you, Calvary family. It's always a joy and a blessing to be able to share God's word with you. would like to remind you that if you need prayer at all, please let us know. We'd love to join you for prayer. My email address is uh, pastornoel420 at gmail.com. That's pastornoel420, all one word, at gmail.com. And we continue to meet, meet in person every Sunday morning at 9 o'clock and every Wednesday evening at 7 o'clock. So we look forward to seeing you here soon. I'd like to talk to you today about being a gentle giant. You know, one of the common questions we get is, what does a Christian look like? Once a person comes to faith in Christ, how does that life change? And what are the attributes that comprise that new life in Christ? And I'm driven to Galatians chapter 5 because in in verses 22 and 23, the Apostle Paul lists out what he calls the fruit of the Spirit. In other words, once you give your life to Christ, there are certain fruits that should be manifest and should be expressed in our new life in Christ. And this is what it says. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness. And then he says in verse 23, gentleness and self-control. Of all these fruit, the one that probably doesn't get as much attention is gentleness. And I want to talk to you today about how the Bible calls us as followers of Jesus to be gentle giants. Let's pray. We thank you, God, for this time we'll spend in your word. I pray you would use today's message to teach us, to encourage us, to empower us to live like gentle giants as your word commands. And I pray for those who are watching now, whatever their needs are, that they might be able to cast them on you. And you would, Lord, respond with your amazing power. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You know, being a Christian implies many things. It's not just what you know, what you believe, and what you do. It's also in how you think, what you think about, what attitude you show, and how you say what you say, and how you do what you do. In one word, we are called to be gentle giants. The biblical word is meek. The biblical word for gentleness is meek. And truly meek Christians are gentle giants. And this is what it looks like. Proverbs 15.1 says, A gentle answer quiets anger, but a harsh one stirs it up. Gentleness diffuses conflict. It disarms critics. It's persuasive. It's attractive. And gentleness communicates love. Now, if you're married, the quickest way to improve your marriage is to start talking to your spouse more gently. It'll do wonders. Imagine how many married couples could benefit from Proverbs 15.1, which again says, a gentle answer quiets anger, but a harsh one stirs it up. Any fool can be selfish. Any fool can be rough. Any fool can be rude. But a gentle answer goes a long way. In any marriage, you'll hurt each other emotionally many times. So a great marriage is simply the union of two gentle people. And that gentleness often shows itself in forgiveness. You could say that a great marriage is simply the union of two great forgivers. And that's also part of gentleness. Gentleness is not only the key to an effective marriage, but it's also the key to effective parenting. If you're a parent, never discipline your children out of anger or frustration, but always gently and out of love. The Bible says in Ephesians 6, verse 4, Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up. In other words, tenderly, with loving kindness, in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. You know, let your gentle response do the same in your relationships. You know, wise parents show love through gentleness. Let your response do the same in all of your relationships, whether whether or not you're married or have children, the principle is the same for all relationships. Remember, a gentle answer quiets anger, but a harsh one stirs it up. 
You know, another benefit of, gentle, of gentleness is that it calms conflict. When you are a gentle giant, you can calm conflict. Have you noticed that human beings have a tendency to mimic other people's emotions, especially if you're sitting or standing right across from them? The reason we do this is because of mirror neurons in our brains that allow us to sympathize and mirror what other people feel. I've observed, for example, that when I'm in a conversation with someone, often to show that we are listening and show empathy, we use those same words that they're using. For instance, if somebody gets angry with you, you get angry back. If somebody is really miserable and you hang around that person long enough, you get miserable too. You could say that you get what you give. And that's why it's so important that we think about what we're giving, what we're projecting. And if it's not gentleness, chances are you're not going to get gentleness back. Remember what Proverbs 51 says, a gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. In the same way, when someone raises their voice against you, you usually raise your voice back, but then they raise their voice higher. Then you raise your voice higher. Then pretty soon things have escalated, and then your emotions go out of control. This is why it's so important that you remember what this is. You know, there's a, the Bible offers a different way to respond. And this is, brings us back to Proverbs 51. A gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. Let me give you a little tip that will save you a lot of heartache and conflict in your marriage, in your parenting, in your friendships, and at work. When another person raises their voice, lower yours. When you do that, you're demonstrating strength under control. Another word for strength under control is the word gentleness. Gentleness diffuses conflict. It de-escalates anger. A gentle person does not overreact and is not driven by their emotions. A gentle person demonstrates strength under control. In fact, the, word, the Greek word in the Bible for gentleness is the word proutis. Some older English translations of the Bible translate proutis as meek. The word meek isn't used much anymore because, unfortunately, meek has become a synonym for weak. But gentleness or proutus, meekness, is anything but, but weak. In fact, the word proutus was used to refer to a wild stallion that had been tamed. Think about that image. If you go out in the hills and you find a wild stallion, it's unbridled and even dangerous with a, with a strength that could kill you pretty quickly. But if you tame that stallion, it's still just as strong, but the strength is brought under control. The strength, you could say, is bottled up for the master's use. And when you learn true gentleness as a man or woman of God, you don't become weak. You just bring your strength under God's control and use it for his purposes. Now think about this. What is your normal reaction to raised voices, such as when your kids are misbehaving, or you're having a disagreement with your spouse or a close friend. Why do you think responding in gentleness rather than anger is so disarming? Why does it get people's attention? The key here is to look for ways to practice gentleness, not just for now, but routinely, to make it part of who you are. How do, you, how do people react when you respond to them with gentleness? You may even want to record your efforts and their effect and share it with those around you. Now, gentleness offers another advantage, and it's this. Pleasant people, gentle people, are persuasive. You know, Proverbs 25, 15 tells us that gentle speech breaks down rigid defenses. Gentle speech breaks down rigid defenses. You could say that gentleness is persuasive. If you have a successful career in sales, you may know that already. There was a time when the hard sell the loudest advertisement, or the strongest sales pitch might have closed the deal. But today, gentleness is what works. Most people today buy something because someone they trust recommended it. A trusted friend or a salesperson's gentle recommendation today is far more persuasive than a loud sales pitch. Just think about how many people today rely on Yelp for restaurant selections, or they rely on Facebook and other sources of social media where people have access to the opinions of other people. And by the way, 
the fact that gentleness is persuasive is not just true in sales. It's true in just about every area of life. The Bible says this over and over again. Proverbs 25, 15. Gentle speech breaks down rigid defenses. Are you trying to convince a family member or a coworker to do something that they're feeling defensive about? Gentle words, not pushy tactics, will get through their defenses. You know, those of us who are in ministry, we want to persuade everyone who hears to live for Jesus. But we have to do it in a gentle way. If we stood in front of people yelling at them, they'd eventually stop listening. But what we've discovered, especially today, is that gentleness is persuasive. That's why the Bible calls us to be gentle giants. We stand apart. We're set apart through our gentleness. You know, a different translation of Proverbs 25, 15 says it this way. A gentle word can get through to the hard head. How true is that? A gentle word can get through to the hard-headed. Now, what does this mean for you? If you're a parent or a teacher, screaming at a child never works. Anger and frustration only create fear, resentment, and defensiveness. But what does work? Gently disciplining in love. Gently disciplining in love. And doing so consistently and with love. Now, here's yet another translation of the same verse. Proverbs 25, 15, it says, Patience and gentle talk can convince a ruler and overcome any problem. Patience and gentle talk can convince a ruler and overcome any problem. Many of us don't live in cultures with a ruler, but we all have some kind of boss, supervisor, or authority in our lives and this translation reminds us that with gentleness, we can persuade even those in authority over us. The Bible says in Proverbs 16, 21, a wise, mature person is known for his understanding. The more pleasant his words, the more persuasive he is. A wise, mature person is known for his understanding. The more pleasant his words, the more persuasive he is. In that verse, there's a connection between the words pleasant and persuasive. If you want to be persuasive, you must first be pleasant. Being pleasant is a mark of maturity. You know, fools are rude. They're unpleasant. And the wiser and more mature you are, the more pleasant and positive your speech becomes. Friends, I want you to remember this. You're never persuasive when you're abrasive. Gentleness is persuasive. You're never persuasive when you're abrasive, but gentleness is persuasive. Let me give you another advantage, another benefit of gentleness. For those who may be wondering, what good is gentleness in our culture today? Why would the Bible call us to be gentle giants? Well, gentleness is also attractive. Uh, 1 Timothy 6.11 says, pursue what God approves of, a godly life, Faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. Pursue what God approves of. A godly life, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. Do you want to be attractive? You might say you don't care about looking good. But attractiveness goes much deeper than what you look like physically. Someone who's attractive is appealing to other people on the inside as much as on the outside. And the Bible says that if you want to become more attractive, you need to learn to be gentle. That's why Paul says to Timothy, pursue what God approves of. And what does he approve of? A godly life, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. Remember, gentleness is strength under control. It doesn't mean you're weak. It doesn't mean you're a pushover. You're actually strong, but that strength is managed. It's under control, and it's one of the marks of someone who follows Jesus. And gentleness makes you more attractive to the people around you. You know, the Bible tells the story of Ruth and Boaz, two gentle people who were attracted to each other and ended up changing the world together. The Bible says that Boaz was a successful young farmer. One day he 
saw strangers out in the field taking what was left after his, after his workers had harvested. That wasn't unusual. It was common for the poor to find food that way. But he noticed in particular a young woman who was named Ruth. She was poor because her husband had died, leaving her with very little. Her mother-in-law also was a widow. And Ruth had decided to stay with Naomi, her father-in-law, to care for her, her mother-in-law to care for her. Now, why would Ruth do that? Because she was a gentle person. She had strength under control. She could have gone on to pursue other things, but she was loyal to her, and she wanted to look after her. And when Boaz saw Ruth in the field, he could have demanded that she leave, but instead he allowed her to continue picking from his field and even commanded her commended her for caring for her mother-in-law. Now, how did Ruth respond? In Ruth 2, verses 13 and 14, Ruth responds to Boaz by saying, you are very kind to me, sir. You have made me feel better by speaking gently to me. Eventually, Boaz and Ruth, uh, Boaz invited Ruth to share a meal with him. She ate until she was satisfied. And then he gave her more food to take home. He was kind. He was gentle. He was a powerful man and chose to keep that strength under control and use it to care for other people. And that care extended to these strangers who were living off the scraps and the leftovers of his own harvest. So as the story goes, Boaz and Ruth Mary, and it turns out, and again, this was all providentially designed by God, their great-grandson was King David. And it was King, it was through King David's line that Jesus eventually was born. Here's a story of two gentle people and how their gentleness led them to meet each other. And God used them to bring to this earth his only son. Are you attractive to other people? Do you have a gentleness that makes other people want to be around you like Ruth and Boaz? If not, you can change that today by intentionally pursuing the things that God approves of. And one of those things is gentleness. You don't need me to tell you that we live in a very rough and tumble world. Being nasty, being rude, being abrasive is more common than not. And it doesn't just show in personal interactions, but it's something you see even on social media in the way that people express themselves in writing it's a very anti-gentle culture. This is where I believe we as Christians who live like gentle giants can set ourselves apart. We can stand out and show the world that you can be strong and gentle at the same time. Because remember, the definition of gentle, the definition of meek is strength under control. And we could accomplish so much more not just for ourselves. We could accomplish so much more to advance the kingdom of God if we express gentleness. Through this message, I want to encourage you to be a gentle giant, to be a gentle giant in front of your family and friends, your coworkers, your neighbors, those around you. I can assure you, friend, that you will get much farther in life if you're gentle and not abrasive, if you're meek, and not rude. There's a reason why the Bible describes gentleness, meekness as a fruit of the Spirit. I encourage you to uncover the power of gentleness and to become a gentle giant. Because when you do, not only will your life change, but God will use you to persuade and attract so many other lives that your influence will include not those not just those people around you today but your spiritual legacy will extend through many generations may god continue to bless you and may god use today's message to encourage you to be a gentle giant let's pray father in heaven thank you so much for teaching us today about the attributes of a gentle giant the benefits the blessings of a gentle giant there's a reason why gentleness, meekness are one of the fruit of the Spirit. You command us, Lord, to be bearers of gentleness, bearers of meekness. 
And what we learn today is that gentleness, to be a gentle giant, is far more effective than not being one. So help us, Lord, to recognize the power of gentleness, to utilize it in our everyday interactions and lives, and to use it to gain influence over those around us that they too might be blessed. In Jesus' name. And we also pray for those who are acting abrasively, rudely, who are not showing gentleness, but instead are showing the opposite, that they would reconsider their ways and understand the true power of gentleness. In Jesus' name, we thank you. Amen. Well, God bless you all. Thanks again for joining us today. May God continue to bless you, and may God help you to become a gentle giant.